As a kid, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was basically just known as a movie with Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny in it. As well as the best piano duel the world has ever seen between two ducks. In reality though, Roger Rabbit is a live action animated noir about murder, adultery, missing wills, the LA freeway system, and racial segregation. Wait, hold on. What was that last one? Could Who Framed Roger Rabbit really be about racial segregation? Among being one of the only times you'll see your favorite Warner Brothers and Disney cartoon characters on screen together, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is one of the first films to combine live action and animation and make it look real. Now, I'm not discounting those dancing penguin waiters or Jerry Mouse and Gene Kelly's tap dancing. I'm just saying that Space Jam came out 10 years later and it has got nothing on Roger Rabbit. Honestly, Who Framed Roger Rabbit is one of the greatest films of all time. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. Over 25 years later, many critics still agree that this film stands out among the rest. A classic noir story about a bitter and washed up PI, Eddie Valiant, who has to solve the framing of cartoon character Roger Rabbit for the murder of cartoon producer and owner of Toontown, Marvin Acme. Meanwhile, Judge Doom uses Acme's murder as a ploy in his evil scheme to destroy all of Toontown in order to build a freeway through Los Angeles. To anyone who's not paying attention, this just sounds like a really intricate plot. But let's dig a little deeper. The film takes place in LA in the year 1947. In the real world, this was the height of the Jim Crow laws, which segregated whites and African Americans from being in the same places or even using the same things. There was often a designated black part of town. Judge Doom wants to tear down the red car trolley system, which in the film and in history was usually used by those who couldn't afford to have a car. Doom wants to tear down the red car and destroy Toontown in order to build a freeway for the wealthy humans, which is a little something we like to call gentrification, which ends up driving the property value up and the original occupants out, something that is still a very big issue in LA today. But what else leads us to these racist connections? Well, let's take a look at the way tunes are treated in the film. You don't see any cartoons in typically respected positions, like cartoon lawyers or doctors or teachers. Basically, all of the tunes are performers. In Roger Rabbit, the Ink and Paint Club is where tunes perform, but only humans are allowed to be patrons. Much like how at that time, the Cotton Club in Harlem, New York, only allowed white audiences, but featured some of the greatest African-American performers, such as Duke Ellington, Sammy Davis Jr., and Louis Armstrong. So could Who Framed Roger Rabbit really have this racial subtext? From sexual innuendos, cigars, horny babies, busty femme fatales, and even alcoholism, this seems way too racy for a film that has its own Disneyland ride. Not only that, but why did Disney allow their mascot to appear in such a racy film? Producer Steven Spielberg convinced studios like Disney, Warner Brothers, Fleischer Studios, Felix the Cat Productions, and Universal to lend their characters to this film, with some stipulations, of course, that every Warner Brothers character must have equal screen time with every Disney character. But that still doesn't exactly explain why these studios allowed their cartoon characters to be in a film about racism. What many people don't know is that this film is actually based on the 1981 novel, Who Censored Roger Rabbit by Gary K. Wolfe. While some elements of the book are very similar to the film, the novel interacts with the world of comic strip characters instead of cartoons, and it is set in the present day. This racial subtext is a lot more obvious in the novel. It utilizes the concept of human-only and tune-only establishments more, as well as tunes who have become more successful by assimilating into human culture. The tunes also speak through speech bubbles, like you see in practically every comic strip. However, some tunes have found a way to suppress this and talk more human, like Jessica Rabbit. Of course, the film adaptation subdues the novel's somewhat heavy-handed racial undertones. But instead of erasing it entirely, Zemeckis and his crew reinterprets it with the story's time period. And these racial themes are more intertwined into the film's overall narrative. I personally believe this is partially why Who Framed Roger Rabbit is such a standout film. 
In addition to highlighting the golden age of animation, it also sparked the modern era of American animation, as well as the Disney Renaissance that began just a year later with The Little Mermaid. Roger Rabbit is an incredibly important film that transcends the stereotype that cartoons can only be in kids' movies and proves that animation is a unique medium of filmmaking and not just a genre. You heard it here first, kids. Animated movies can have wacky cartoon characters and discuss serious racial issues. And seeing as by my standards, this conspiracy is mostly true. On the plausibility meter, I give the Who Framed Roger Rabbit conspiracy five penguin waiters out of five. As always, if you guys have a suggestion for any conspiracy you'd like us to cover, write it in the comments or send us an email. If you'd like to check out any of the research we did while writing this episode, links are down in the description. And make sure you stick around and check out that preview for next week's episode. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, it's James. Before you catch that preview for next week, some friends of ours created an app called Crumbles. It allows you to create and send video mashups to your friends. Go check it out in the iTunes store and tell them James sent you. Peter Pan has got to be one of the most popular characters in Western culture. Created by Scottish novelist and playwright J.M. Barrie, and most famously portrayed again in the 1953 animated Disney film, this forever young and flying boy is a friend to fairies and the courageous leader of a group of boys who wound up in Neverland. That's right, the Lost Boys. Peter's gang of loyal counterparts that help him protect Neverland from stinky grown-ups. Especially the dreaded pirate Captain Hook and his crew. But did you ever wonder what happened to Peter's accomplices if they dare grow older? Could Peter Pan actually be killing off the Lost Boys?